Their own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz, one after another. Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured, Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Move it! Freedom came under attack. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind. And safely. Afghans by the thousands desperate to escape life under the Taliban. I'm sitting down to talk with Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. Senator Lankford currently serves as chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs and Federal Management. He's worked fervently to defend religious freedom both here in America and abroad. Senator Lankford was directly involved in the ACLJ efforts to bring home imprisoned Pastor Andrew Brunson from Turkey and Pastor Brian Naren in India. Senator Lankford will be joining us today to talk about his plans to bring Afghan refugees escaping the Taliban to Oklahoma. It's September 13th, 2021, and we are joined by Senator Lankford from Oklahoma. And Senator, I wanted to uh, get your feedback over the last few weeks. Obviously, we were coming off of a weekend where uh, we, we uh, memorialized the last 20 years since September 11th, uh, a time when, for those of us that lived through it, you know, it is kind of those moments where you realize that a lot of us, a lot of people, even in this crew here, uh, were two and three years old when some of this stuff was happening. But for those of us that lived through it, we saw a very uniting moment for America. Uh, nine months into a Bush presidency, you now go 20 years in the future, or nine months into a Biden presidency, uh, tragedy happens related to that. And it's really unfortunate to, wait to see where the country has gone in the last 20 years in forms of, of uniting over certain things. But maybe, and you can kind of touch on this, do you feel that there was maybe uniting not necessarily for the administration, but in uh, seeing sort of the horrors that were coming out of Afghanistan? There were, and I would tell you, uh, talking to so many veterans of the war in Afghanistan over the last couple of really weeks now, uh, I hear two things that come up over and over and over again. Number one is they're shocked by how people, uh, how, what they see of what we left in Afghanistan, uh, how painful it is to be able to see what was left on the table there, how they abandoned Bagram Air Force Base, how they abandoned the embassy, uh, all those things, there's just a lot of frustration on and uh, what they actually saw there. And they know we were going to get out of Afghanistan. No one assumed we were going to be in Afghanistan forever. But the way that we got out is very, very, very painful. And the second thing I hear from people over and over again is there were a couple of people that were fighting alongside of me that were Afghans, uh, that they put their lives on the line just like I did. It's that they weren't armed. They were a translator and they were traveling with me. We always told them that if this goes sideways and the Taliban take over, we're going to get you out safely. And uh, they were pretty frustrated by that. So they're frustrated about how it ended, they're frustrated with what we spoke to the rest of the world and to some of those translators that work with us and side by side with our military forces uh, and what they've continued to be able to see from there to see us literally as a country abandon Americans in Afghanistan and abandon individuals that fought alongside of us. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you touched on something I think that's important. And uh, the Afghan people, whether it be the translators or, or people that fought alongside Americans, uh, were kind of metaphorically thrown under the bus from the Biden administration as you know, people who, who you know, abandoned ship, ran away quickly. Uh, that's the opposite of what I've received in these interviews that I've conducted over the last few weeks. Uh, it seems like very compassionate people, very sweet people. And we as Americans are compassionate people. I think conservatives often get labeled uh, in a way that I don't really appreciate because we can all look to that, those scenes that happened a month ago and uh, see the horrors that they were and say, how can we help? What can we do? I know you were one of the people who uh, discussed taking in refugees in Oklahoma, uh, a somewhat controversial thing, uh, but not really. You know, I think for 
you know, it becomes a very uh, loud minority online that people think represents conservatives or Republicans and think these are not compassionate people who don't want help. I want to know, though, what was your decision making to come to that conclusion? Because look, in some of the states, uh, some other people in, in your own party uh, have, have taken an opposite approach. So I would say that the first thing that came to my mind was that all these different uh, veterans of the war in Afghanistan, they came to me and said, these are folks that I know. They fought alongside of me. I know them. I know their families. Uh, these are folks that laid their life on the line. These are freedom loving people. These are the folks that are fighting against the Taliban. These aren't terrorists. Right. These are the exact type of people that we want to advance and that we want to be able to support. And so the, how I came to that decision was talking to so many veterans of the war in Afghanistan and what they were saying about those individuals and how they want them to be able to get out. So that's the first part. The second part is in Oklahoma, we took in a lot of uh, Vietnamese 48 years ago when they were fleeing during that time period. Those are thriving members of our community at this point very engaged with lots of Vietnamese churches in Oklahoma. We have lots of communities that are engaged and business people and all kinds of folks. We did this as a state five decades ago with the Vietnamese. Uh, we will do this again with Afghans that are coming in to our country. And in Oklahoma, we'll probably have about 1,800 to 2,000 Afghans uh, that will move into Oklahoma. Those should be vetted individuals. Those should be folks that have worked alongside of our military, worked alongside of our State Department. I don't want to just randomly grab uh, people in Afghanistan to be able to move to Oklahoma. They need to be fully vetted. They need to go through the process. But most of these folks that, uh, that are moving this direction are exactly that. For those that are not fully vetted, they don't need to come to the United States at all until we know who they are and what their background is and how they were trying to be able to flee out of Afghanistan. That says a lot about you, though. It says a lot about the state of Oklahoma that you guys would support uh, this kind of move in general. I think that uh, it's the Christian thing to do as someone who I know is uh, a person of faith, that it's important to to disconnect maybe you know partisan politics and actually look at the heart of it. because. I, I know about you and, and other people, you couldn't watch the children being passed over the gates. You couldn't watch those things happening in military having to take them uh, even before there was the, the ISIS attack and not say, how can I help? And I think a lot of people uh, could turn to the, you, the administration, to the presidential administration and say, how can I help and feel like they have no answers. But there are people like you, uh, Senator Langford in the Senate, and there's people in Congress who are saying, okay, the administration may be failing us right now, but you have a voice and you represent a people. And I think that's that's got to be an important step for, for anyone right now to really look to their local representation. Yeah, th this should be a moment that nonprofits and churches should step up and say, what can we do to be able to walk alongside these families? Because it's one thing to say, these folks are coming in destitute, afraid, escaping from the ruthless Taliban. We got them out of that environment. It's another thing for the churches and nonprofits to be able to, and other entities to wrap around them and to say, what are we gonna do to help you integrate into society and to be able to make sure that you have connection points here. And again, again many of these refugees are not coming to America. They're coming to other countries as well. Uh, so, but those that do come to the United States, we need to make sure that we actually engage and uh, that we make sure we show them, for me, the love of Christ uh, to those individuals, uh, but to also be able to make sure that we help them to be able to survive through this time period, a pretty amazing transition for them, as a, not just as a country, but as a family and as an individual. Absolutely, and you look back now, it's been roughly a month when we're recording this. I wanted people to see the raw emotions that were coming out of people and remember that this in a year, in two years, in three years, in 10 years, uh, because it's so easy to look at 9-11 and sort of this historical viewpoint now, uh, pre-social media, pre uh, the way that we kind of have to run our lives now. And I wanna make sure that these kind of interviews were, were preserved. So regardless of what happens years from now, that people know the intention that was coming out of people like you and were coming out of uh, beyond Washington. But I do wanna take you back just about a month ago. A lot of people say this was inevitable, that this uh, crisis was gonna happen, that the exit was gonna be bad, in general, and people say, well, maybe it was the Trump administration's fault. Maybe they, a lot of fingers being pointed. Do you feel like this was inevitable? And, uh, you know, we were given that 90 day timeline of potential, you know, when, when the Taliban could take over, obviously it took much less time than that. Was it inevitable? And were you properly informed as a Senator of what was, what was going down? No, I, I was not properly informed other than saying that they felt like that there was a short time period that, until the Taliban took over. And initially it was a year and then maybe it was by the end of the year, and then maybe it was within a month, and then obviously it was within days. It was not inevitable. It's the way that this actual withdrawal was done uh, that really led to this. So let me just highlight a few things on this. 
One is they gave up Bagram Air Force Base and moved their operations to a commercial airfield there in Kabul. That's a terrible mistake. We've already talked to the administration about this. I've talked to the Pentagon about this. Basically, they had a timeline that regardless of the situation on the ground, they were gonna run their timeline. That's a huge mistake uh, to have. You had those individuals trying to be able to get into an unsecured airport. You had commercial flights that were moving as well as military flights. There's no reason that we could not have maintained Bagram Air Force Base and be able to use that as a secure facility. Second big mistake they had was they pulled out of the embassy. The embassy was the place where Afghan nationals would go to be able to get paperwork processed ask questions to be able to go through all that. Once they pulled those individuals out of the embassy, we've literally got people crowding the streets around the airport, waving papers saying, I don't know who to talk to anymore. I don't know where to go anymore to be able to help process this. So they literally created that chaos. The third thing they did that was the most significant part at the beginning of this is the Biden administration did not hold the Taliban to account. During the Trump administration, if the Taliban moved into areas that they had been pushed out of before, if they moved back in those areas, they faced military consequences to it. The Biden administration, when the Taliban moved, they just ignored it and let the Taliban move. They should have never done that. 2,500 American soldiers were able to keep 100,000 Taliban at bay because the Taliban, if they moved an inch, had consequences for it. When that didn't happen anymore, the Taliban just started running and things started collapsing. When Bagram Air Force Base was closed down, there wasn't the close air support that was needed even for the Afghans uh, to be able to support them. And so it just started this whole spiral effect of one bad decision after another in the pullout. Uh, so it did not have to happen this way. Uh, it was done because there were a series of bad decisions that were made by the Biden team that actually led directly to this. Yeah, and it's had universal consequences, consequences internationally. We know we've seen people from the UK and other allies, not just our adversaries, our allies who are saying, we don't know what we can trust now from America. How do we regain that trust? How do we regain a trust from the allies? What can people do? Because there is that big concern. You look at you look at us on a global stage, America on the global stage, the longest war, 20 years, uh, a, a, a big problem we had, and I've repeated this a number of times in the series is, for a lot of people, you, you see a movie and if the last five minutes, the ending is terrible, that's all you remember. And I'm nervous on the world stage that that's all that's gonna be remembered here. And we're gonna have a mess. And we do have a mess currently when it comes to our allies. Yeah, it, to do it in just a, a human term, everyone knows that you can lose trust in an instant, but it takes years and years and years to gain trust back. Uh, so when you earn trust, you earn it. Uh, over years of time to be able to prove I am trustworthy. If you give it up, that exact instance, you've lost trust and you've got to start all over again. So in many ways, the United States of America now on the international stage has to regain trust again and has to be able to prove that they're worthy of that trust around the, around the world. And I'm not talking about militarily engaging all over the world again, but we've lost trust based on the fact that the entire world can look at the way Biden handled this withdrawal and what he did and how he did it and can say America can't be trusted anymore, that's a major problem for us in the world stage. If folks are living in Taiwan, folks are living in Ukraine, folks are living in multiple different regions around the world where they're looking to the United States saying, in that moment, will you be there? Right now, I would assume they're all a little nervous at this point. And the talking point seems to be, and it comes from the Biden administration, is to divert it to, well, this was costing us $300 million a day. Look at the financial savings that we're going to have. Uh, something that seems to be playing to conservatives. But as I said, I think what they're not taking account for is obviously all of the, the issues that came out of it, but that conservatives uh, mean a lot more than just money. And it's not just about, we're saving money here. Look, shouldn't you be happy with this? We had to end this war, it was costing us so much money. Sure, that is a factor. And, and, and people like you and most people even on our team here were for the, yeah, everyone eventually getting out of Afghanistan. But that seems so misguided to be like, that's where we're gonna point the blame. We're gonna point the blame to, well, we had to, it was costing us too much money. When people see bloodshed uh, from our own American uh, troops and hundreds of, of Afghan people now. Yeah, it is, it is absurd for the left to think, I'm gonna tell progressives this was cheaper, and so ignore all those lives that are lost, ignore all those women that are now being put back in burqas and they can't get education anymore, ignore the Taliban running over everybody, ignore them uh, taking our equipment. If they were so concerned about fiscal responsibility, they wouldn't have left billions of dollars of American equipment sitting on the tarmac uh, at Bagram Air Force Base. If they're really concerned about the fiscal issues, we would have recovered all of that equipment and be able to pull it out rather than abandoning it and actually leaving it there or giving it to the Taliban uh, for them to be able to have. So 
it was very, very clear. They were not concerned about the fiscal issues here at this point. They were just concerned about how, how fast can we get out regardless of the consequences. Yeah, and you keep saying the Taliban, we've talked obviously about the Taliban continually in this series, what it's about. Now I've asked this question to quite a few people, but I want to get your thoughts too. Is it as insane to you to hear the words the Taliban now being used as essentially political partners with us? Where uh, it just, I can't fathom it when every time it comes out of the mouth of somebody representing the White House uh, or, or anyone in general, treating the Taliban, the name even, with respect, it's maddening and it's it feels... Uh, for the American people, for those of us who were, I mean, I was 15 and 9-11, not that old, but I, certainly old enough. Uh, last 20 years, the Taliban is not a name that we set out to uh, give any respect to. And they didn't exactly take over in a way that uh, honors that respect. Yeah, the, 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 the Taliban are a ruthless political organization that runs the, the country uh, under their iron thumb of them just squashing any dissent. Uh, the Taliban moved into these different communities and people said, hi, they moved so fast. They would move into an area, they would pull out everyone who'd worked with the Americans, slaughter them in the public square and say, is anyone else interested in opposing us? And then they'd move town to town to town to do it. Uh, this is not a reputable political organization that we should be negotiating with. And it is chilling to me every time I hear President Biden or Secretary Blinken uh, talk about how well, we're gonna work with the Taliban to get the remaining Americans out. That basically sounds like a hostage situation to me where you've got a ruthless organization that we're going to pay them money to be able to get american citizens back out now when they talk about taliban checkpoints and how many checkpoints they're going through they have to pay people at each one of those checkpoints uh, to be able to hand money to these different taliban ruthless thugs uh, that we're actually buying people's way out of it here all because they failed in the process to actually evacuate americans out of there to be able to leave an opportunity uh, for the Afghans to be able to fight on their own or to not have a chaotic withdrawal like what we really saw. What we saw was a lot of broken promises as well. We saw a lot of people left. Uh, you know, they're still trying to get people out, work with the Taliban, as you said, you know, saying, oh, we can withhold trillion, you know, billions of dollars, millions, trillions of dollars from, from the Taliban. So that's how we're gonna, we're gonna play the long game here with that. Uh, a lot of people though saw those broken promises and they wanna know where we go from here. I mean, not only just ramifications that could come but now that we know what's happened with what you can do, where are these ramifications for these broken promises? Where do we go from here? Yeah, a, a couple of things are there. Obviously, we have to still get American citizens that are out and uh, legal permanent residents of the United States out of Afghanistan and uh, so they can flee out of harm's way. So for those individuals and their immediate family uh, to be able to get them out is a significant priority. You've got pastors that are there that are trying to be able to flee for their life. Uh, you've got uh, women that are there that have been trained as mayors and college professors and teachers uh, that are now fleeing for their life at this point because they know they'll be living under the domination of the, of the Taliban or be murdered in the street and saying, this is what, what we do to women that get educated. We've got to be able to get those individuals out, whether they come to the United States or other third places. Uh, th there are lots of questions on yeah. that one. Yeah, how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, that sounds like one of the big questions. Right. How do you, but you, we can say that, yeah. but is that part of how do we as American people, when you feel like you have an administration not on your side, how can we do that? Yeah, for, for Americans, obviously we, we're people of faith. We continue to be able to pray for individuals uh, and for what's going on there. We continue to be able to work with countries that are around Afghanistan. There are several other countries that are allies. Uh, to the United States that we can continue to be able to work with them and people can get across those borders. We can get them processed and to be able to get into other countries. We can stay engaged with nonprofit organizations that are helping uh, people that are actually going through the refugee process, uh, that are trying to get education, they're trying to get jobs, uh, that are trying to be able to connect with our churches. So if you're connected to a church or a refugee organization, you can financially give or volunteer your time. I've already talked to some folks that they do English as a second language uh, training to folks. They're already engaging and trying to train more people so that they can engage with some of these Afghan refugees uh, to be able to help them with their English studies as well for those that don't already know English that weren't translators. So there, there are several ways that we can practically get involved, but I do encourage people to practically get involved in the process. We're hearing now about the rise of terror again, whether that's through the Middle East or whether that's coming from Afghanistan, whether it's Al Qaeda, ISIS. A few years ago, during the last administration, it got very quiet uh, on this topic. I think a lot of people did forget. I was on the radio or on TV every week. It felt like saying, this is a topic that's not being addressed politically. People have forgotten about ISIS. People have forgotten what it was like to live through even just the Obama administration's response to, uh, to the Middle East, to 
uh, everything in general. We, we forgot, you know, we really did. How do we keep people educated in the political process, not just conservative, liberal, but just to remind people, and this become a topic that it permeates uh, any debates that come. I mean, you barely even heard that come up in, a, in the presidential debates last year. People weren't talking about the Middle East because it was so quiet, because ISIS had been decimated. And I'm concerned that, I mean, obviously, I don't think we're headed towards a play, plan of peace for the next four years, but this becomes part of, of a platform and talking points. So clearly, there were ways to stop this, to eliminate terror, to work with, to do the Abraham Accords in Israel. There was so much happening positive. It's really heartbreaking for those of us who have stood up for these uh, topics the last decades uh, to see it all unravel and for people to quickly forget. And this not even become, even for Republicans, not even something they address. Uh, you know, it's a success that's forgotten. Let me go through a couple of those things there. You mentioned the Abraham Accords. That's exceptionally important. Uh, those are, that's four Arab nations making an agreement with Israel to normalize those relations, create economic ties, travel ties, engagement. The Abraham Accords begin with a radical statement about religious liberty, saying for these countries that are signing on the, the Abraham Accords, we will honor religious liberty in our country. Some people thought that would never occur in an Arab country. When the Trump, what the Trump administration did and Mike Pompeo and Jared Kushner and all that team around President Trump, what President Trump led during that time period was a remarkable connection of countries in the region to each other and to religious liberty. That needs to continue to accelerate. That's one of the biggest issues. There are five countries in it now. There's no reason there shouldn't be 15 or 20 countries that are in that in the days ahead if the Biden team will continue to be able to work through that. Second thing is we've got to continue to isolate Iran. Iran is the largest destabilizing force in the entire region. As this Biden administration continues to engage with Iran and to be able to release sanctions and other things with them or to be able to allow Iran to be able to drag their feet on the uh, inspections and such, uh, that's a major problem and every country in the region sees that as a major problem. This administration needs to keep maximum pressure on Iran and know that's the way that you stabilize the Middle East is develop relationships with other countries, continue to isolate Iran. The Iranian people live under a terrible regime uh, that's there and so this is not an issue with the Iranian people, this is an issue of the regime in Iran. And the third thing that you have to do is you have to continue to be able to elevate this among the American people so we do not forget. September 11th will still continue to come every single year. We can't after 20 years just stop and forget because there are people in the Middle East right now in these groups like ISIS, uh, Al-Shabaab in Africa, and uh, you've got um, uh, Al-Qaeda is still on the rise. You've got Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. You've got all these different groups that they intensely hate our freedom. They hate it. That's why the Taliban can go in immediately and say, we don't want women to be educated. We want them covered up in burqas. Uh, we don't want a free press. It, it's not they just want to dominate that region. They philosophically don't believe in women having equal rights. They don't believe in a free press. Uh, they don't believe in elections. They're even opposed to the basics of elections. So they, we, we understand we are the epitome worldwide of everything that they hate uh, because we believe in those freedoms. They hate those freedoms. And so they're coming after us. And while we think, why would anyone hate us? We want to be able to have open opportunity for everybody. Well, they do not want to have open opportunity for everybody. They want to stop that worldwide. And we are the great Satan to them that actually is portraying freedom to people. And so we can't lose track of that in the days ahead, that there are people that hate us because of our freedom and want to do anything they can to be able to destroy us. We look back at 9-11 now, 20 years out, and I posted on social media and I felt this way. It became uh, much more emotional this year. Obviously it's been 20 years, but with recent events, uh, it all hit everybody, I think a little different than it has uh, even the last 10 years to see uh, it end in such chaos because it's sort of the catalyst, the beginning and the end of the story, if you will, in some ways. Uh, but as you said, not only can we not forget how we felt then, uh, we have to remember, even if we don't want to, we have to remember, because it is easy to not, not easy, it is more comforting to, to turn off the coverage. I mean, there were times on September 11th, just this past weekend we're recording this, where I was like, enough, I've seen so much of this all day. I, it's physically and emotionally draining, but it's important to not only not forget, but to make ourselves remember and to always remember what happened and how we feel that way, even if we don't want to. And that's just how I wrap up all of these. I wanted to get your thoughts too, is we do kind of now focus on the ending of, of what you would say is the war on terror now that we're out of Afghanistan. Now, who knows what that means? I think that the war on terror likely continues, but over those 20 years, 
we need to make sure that we remember there was a lot of people who sacrificed their lives, who were there, who were doing the right thing. And there was good that came out of this, even if the ending feels like such a mess. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk to those people, to those families, the Gold Star families, to people who, who lost their lives or people who lost their limbs or even mentally, or people who just served throughout the whole experience and say, people did not die in vain in this war. There was good, and we need to at least respect the fact that so many people went through this. Oh, absolutely. I, I would say a couple things. Obviously, we have several thousand Gold Star families that never wanted to be Gold Star families. They wanted their loved one to be able to come home. Their loved one went to go protect our freedom, and they did. For 20 years, 20 years, we've had no major terrorist attack in the United States. That's not some accident. That's the engagement of these individuals that volunteered their life and their time to be able to go over and to be able to fight against those folks that were coming against us and our freedoms. So we owe the utmost respect to those Gold Star families and continued support for them because they continue to live with the consequences day after day after day. Those that have lost limbs, those that have all kinds of different battle scars on it, they went and they did exactly what their nation asked them to do, stand up for our freedom, to continue to be able to do it in an honorable way, and they did and to be able to set a tone for people there. So not only did they protect the country for two decades from any major terrorist attacks, they also gave the Afghan people and the people in that region a taste of freedom, something they hadn't tasted before. Well, that we all know as Americans, that's a very good taste. You don't forget that taste of freedom and what they've actually experienced. That, that generation has now been educated and what that will mean. So I, I think a lot of people look at it and say, look at the, the departure we were, the Taliban was there, we came in for 20 years and the Taliban came right back, nothing changed. I don't agree. There's a lot that's still going on under the surface that's happening right now. Let's let history play this out and to see where this goes. If the Afghan people re-engage in a whole different way uh, in the days ahead and be able to flip and turn the Taliban out still, they've got to be able to run their country, that's true. But we have given an opportunity to them to be able to succeed, and not just for them, but for multiple others that are in the region as well. So there's a lot that's still going on in that region that we'll continue to be able to pay attention to in the days ahead. So I, I can't say thank you enough to those folks that served. And there are folks that served in all kinds of ways, both in our intelligence agencies, our military, our law enforcement here in the United States, and multiple other entities that are contractors and diplomats and others. They've literally put their lives on the line uh, for America and for Americans for two decades. And we are very grateful. Senator Langford, thank you so much for joining us and uh, spending a little bit of time with us today. Glad to be able to do it.